So, and uh, welcome back to another episode of Crease Crankers. I am uh, joined here by a very special guest. It is Harvard's head coach, Jerry Byrne. Coach, how you doing? How are things going? Congratulations on the uh, quick and, uh, you know, blazing start here to uh, to the season. Well, not as blazing as we were, you know, maybe a week ago, but, uh, you know, relatively, relatively simmering, I yeah. would guess. Yeah. Um, no, it's good. Thanks for having me. And I, I guess I should have asked, are you Jeff's son? I am Jeff's son. Yes. I did. I did want to touch on that and see if, uh, see if you did rec- yeah, recognize the name. <laughs> you know, I think, I think I, we need to sign a non-disclosure uh, <laughs> yeah. agreement about maybe a few evenings at the park bench and, uh, <laughs> so talk it. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I did want to touch on your Long Island roots. I know you're a Levittown guy. I'm sure the names, you know, Jamie Allen, Doug Hall, maybe ring a bell. Of course. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Of course. There, there, there might be some bronze statues of them on Hempstead <laughs> Turnpike. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I did notice you are so a Shamrock grad as well? I, I am. Okay. I was, uh, I was uh, abducted at birth <laughs> and uh, take, taken to the leafy – Leafy and ivy uh, walls of uh, of yeah. Chaminade against against my will, but worked go. out okay. There you go. Yeah. So I mean, we do have a little bit of beef there. I'm a friar. I, I went to St. Anthony's, so you know, uh, we do have. It's a fine school. It's a fine school. <laughs> I know, and I know you got some friars on the current uh, on the current roster. So uh, please say hello to you know Jackson Green and Jack Spidell. I actually I coached them last year at uh, at Holy Tongue. And, and Greg Campes. And Greg Campes. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to coach him. He was he was a little bit before my time, but. Um, I, I need to. I need to get some uh, flyers. You know, I know. It's three, to, I, well, I, it's three to zero <laughs> flyers to flyers right now. I noticed the roster. I was like, "Jesus, is Coach Byrne having a change of heart here? Is he truly a flyer deep I, down?" You know, <laughs> uh, you know I, 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 I am. I'm kind of like justice when it comes to recruiting. I don't care. I don't care where you're from. Yeah. Rich or poor, what high school, sure. good high school, bad high school. If you can play, you can play. That's it, man. That's it. That's it. That's it. So, uh, yeah. So obviously, you know, uh, you know, I know you were a, a UMass Amherst grad as well. Um, you know, had two stints, you know, at, at Notre Dame and now obviously here at, uh, here at Harvard. Um, but again, just kind of want to touch on maybe just the start that you've had to this season, right? I mean, obviously right now you're averaging 16 goals a game, only trailing Notre Dame, funny enough. Um, but just kind of talk to me a little bit about maybe, you know, your kind of theme or like what you guys, you know, what you preach to your guys and how you want them to play on the offensive end and, uh, you know, things like that. You know, I think, I think you have to start with our, our offensive coordinator is, uh, sure. Neil Hutchinson and sure. he and I coached together at Notre Dame and he was at, uh, Towson and UMBC, um, mm-hmm. before that. So he's a, you know, great young coach, mm-hmm. you know, future head coach. So, you know, I think, you know, you have to, you have to start with what you have. You right. might have a philosophy around uh, sure. offense and how you would like it to play, but there's also a catering and a customization that you have to have based on the talent sure. that you have. And, and that talent, you know, we, we, we're in the middle of our third full season, even though we've been, we've been here for almost five mm-hmm. years. We're, we haven't completed our third full season mm-hmm. yet. And so we're still in that kind of formative stage where we're recruiting our, you know, our types of guys. And so it's that juggling between I'd like to play this way, right? but this is what, this is what we have. And and what's the best way to kind of organize that talent. Like, for example, if you're a basketball team and you want to be a running gun three point shooting team and you have a bunch of guys who can't shoot, guess what? You're going to lose a lot of games. You'll be true to your philosophy, but you won't win very much. So, I think it's, it starts with that. I think it starts I, – I like simplicity. Mm-hmm. I think the better the teams that you play have better defenders and better one-on-one defenders. So, sure. you know, whether it's set actions or, sure. all right, we're going to do A and B so we can get to C. But you don't always get to get to C. So I think there's a kind of the fluidity sure. to spacing and the reads sure. while also kind of empowering your guys to – you got to make plays to win, right? Like, yeah, you, play, you know, play free. Yeah, play free, sc- play loose. Yeah, schematics and and all that stuff doesn't matter if you don't have people who are willing to. All right, I'm you know this guy's on my upfield shoulder. I can get underneath, or I, he's not my downfield yeah. shoulder. I can roll back, and so you know I think it's start. Neil does an unbelievable job and creates kind of a really good community of of guys who understand their strengths but understand how we want to play. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you know you touched on it, right. You can only kind of 
cater to the talent that you have, right? And, you know, have to obviously have to play to your player's strengths. So certainly, obviously, agree there. Um, you know, we touched on a little bit. I know Ivy League is now in full swing. Uh, obviously, last week, you know, a tough contest with Yale. Um, I wanted to just kind of pick your brain on, like, I guess, you know, I, you always talk about when you get into conference play, you know, it's just like a heightened awareness, right? Or it's just, you know, you need to make those plays and things like that. I guess the biggest differences you see when you just start to get into conference play, is it as simple as it's just the familiarity of the teams and you, know, you guys are just used to playing against them? I mean, you know, it's, you know, the, the you know, we you tend to not play as many midweek games in during your conference schedule. So that changes things for your your preparation is much different than playing, you know, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday. So part of it is you also know your opponent because they're in your not know them in the sense of scouting, but you know them because that's how you're going. One of the ways you're going to be evaluated is how do you do in your league because that's going to predetermine your league tournament and NCAA tournament and, and things like that. So you know, I I don't tend to spend a lot of time kind of talking about one game being more important than others. The you know, people have that mindset already. So they don't need to be reminded. And so, so you know, part of it is you got in our league, you have, you know, some of these rivalries, we you know, have been going on for almost 150 years. So there's more weight in there just because generations have played against each other in this game. So Absolutely. So, you know, so part of it is, you know, when Harvard and Yale play each other, I there may not be a longer rivalry in college sports. I mean, Harvard started playing lacrosse in 1877. Uh -huh. And so, you know, other than wars and some other things that have <laughs> yeah. happened, it's probably kind of an un, yeah. you, know, a, you know, it just goes on. And, you know, that's multiple generations. And yeah. So, you know, why they carry more weight sometimes is because of the media and, and sports coverage. Sure. The, you know, rivalries between alums. I don't, I tend to not over dramatize that. You know, guys are yeah. competitive. I'm competitive. Like, yeah. I'll get into a fight in a pickleball or a squash match yeah. just as easy as yeah. I would in a sporting right. event. Right. You want to win and everything. You have spinning contests, lacrosse game, whatever it is. Which, yeah. Which, as, I, as I've been wont to say, the scoreboard is always on, even when there is no scoreboard. There you go. I like that saying. I might have to steal that, coach. I like that saying. There we go. All right. So I guess, you know, just moving on here, um, you know, you kind of already touched on the recruiting piece a little bit you know, essentially is, hey, if you're a good player, you know, yeah, we'll take you. But I guess just maybe like some certain characteristics that you look for in a recruit or, you know, is it just, you know, obviously, you know, is it seeing him make a couple plays and that's as simple as it is. But I guess just maybe touch on, you know, your recruiting piece. It's funny enough, I know, I, I think my dad and you kind of spoke uh, the last time when I was uh, at like the Under Armour games and things like that. So, uh, but yeah, we'd love to kind of just hear you dive in on, you know, what you yeah. look for. In you're, you're, mu you're much bigger now. I think that final <laughs> jacket was bigger than you back then. Um, yeah, I, I think my size might have took me out of the running for Notre Dame. <laughs> um, the, you know, you get that question a lot. And sure. I, you know, I think it evolves over over time, you know, yeah. and it, it varies by the type of place that you're at because every place has some certain – you know, challenges or opportunities. So, you know, we can't recruit every single guy that's playing lacrosse right now. It's just this is too, yeah. you know, it's the, the high, there's really high expectations here intellectually and, and academically. Not that other places don't have them, but this sure. is, you know, year in, year out, statistically, the hardest school to be admitted to. And so, yeah. so you know, I, I don't go to a game and, and – you know, I mean, you go to a game and you, you recognize talent and then you, you don't want to fall in love too quickly because you might find out that they may not be in love with school as much as you need them to be. Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, there's, there's, there's definitely thing, you know, all things being equal, talent, size, speed, strength and things like that. But, you know, I think the really, the people who are really good at recruiting, everybody can see the really talented sure. player. Sure. And then it becomes, a fight amongst the top 15 schools to secure that guy. Right. And, you know, people think recruiting is this kind of, it's all the same. We're all standing at the same starting line. And it just isn't no. because you have somebody might come from an affluent family and the scholarship is, yep. doesn't matter that much. Sure. You know, for others, I always wanted to go to a 
Ivy League school or an ACC school, sure. and that that and my parents went to a school like that. And you you grew up probably with that kind of yeah. aspiration. And so <laughs> so did. you have you have you have like generational things, and you have societal things, and you have behavioral things, and you have media things that are all affecting that. So it's not like in football, college football, sure. where everybody's you know everybody had the same scholarship, but now some schools have more NIL and more financial aid. So there's, there's so many things go that go into it. But I think the people who are really good at recruiting are not just seeing the really talented, everybody can see him, right? but it's really about who's the guy who hasn't grown yet. Mm -hmm. Who's the guy who's maybe coming out of an injury. Who's the guy who's on a really good team and he's been waiting or working toward his opportunity and he hasn't maybe gotten a moment to shine. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And so that you got to do that well. Yeah. You got to find some kind of some birds with some broken wings and that's, you know envision it, that man. they're going to fly at some point. That's so it. that's it. You know, so that like so what I what I look for in that is, you know, obviously work capacity and compete level sure. and coachability sure. and curiosity I think is really important mindset of yeah. you know the, the self drive to get better cuz there's so many tools to get better on YouTube yeah. and, you know, Instagram and things like that. Curiosity to ask questions of how can I do that? Can I learn how to do that on my own? Do I have to ask somebody to help guide me there? Because just playing on your club team or, or having cool helmets and reversibles and custom gloves, man, if that was the pathway to, to playing at a high level, then God, there'd be a million of those guys playing out there. So I, I think self-drive and curiosity and obviously competitiveness. Love those answers. We truly do. I love that curiosity piece too. I mean, I think that's something that, you know, I think even kids when they're getting recruited are maybe a little hesitant to ask those kind of questions or even ask a coach, you know, Hey, where do you see me, you know, fitting into your team or fitting into your offense or defense, you know, things like that. So yeah, love, love yep. those answers. Um, I, you kind of touched on something I wanted to, you know, whether it's the transfer portal or even the NIL type of money and, and things like that. Um, you know, is that something, you know, when it comes to the NIL money, is that something that truly has come up when it comes to, you know, recruiting for college across? I know you, know, you hear about it in college football and basketball and things like that, um, but wanted to just maybe see, you know, yeah, is that something that has been coming up um, in the college across world? No, it's, it's 100%. Yeah. Um, whether it's here to stay right. is much more interesting. Less less from a the, the NCAA is going to prohibit it, mm -hmm. but more like this money that's going into NIL right. is is not necessarily new money. Right, it's money that's being siphoned from something else. Right. Somebody who may have given a hundred thousand dollars toward an academic scholarship or mm -hmm. maintenance of a field. Mm -hmm. is and now it, giving it toward an NIL collective. And yeah. there's not a new $100,000 <laughs> showing up for that field and for that, yeah. you know what I mean? So there, yeah, 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 yeah. there's, there's going to be some, re, there's going to definitely be some repercussions, but it's definitely here. Right. You know, the Ivy League is, you know, like I tell people, you know what your NIL is? You're, you have the highest starting salary for any college lacrosse graduate. Um but just, I, I wanted to touch a little bit on your Notre Dame tenure, right? So obviously, um, and, and there's, I, it was, I was interested to see there was two different tenures you had there. So you started in, I think it was 1989. That was like your first kind of stop there. And then circled back uh, later on in uh, 2007. So I guess just, um, you know, it, it, it must be pretty amazing to see kind of where that program has gone. Um, obviously, since, you know, you were there maybe from, you know, from the very beginning, um, and just kind of maybe touch on your tenure there, some of the best, you know, defensemen that you got to work with there. And, uh, yeah, just, again, with, working with Coach Corrigan as well. Yeah, no, Kevin and I, you know, I'm, I'm the godfather for his son, Will, who coached with me for four yep. years. Will's out at Air Force now. And, you know, Kevin and my brother Steve were roommates at UVA. And so, oh, wow. so you know, back, you know, overlapped with your with your dad was at North yep. Carolina. So, yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, so kind of always was connected, and I was, you know, uh, Kevin's dad, Gino, and his their family. So kind of just connected with them. And so when Kevin became the head coach, and in the late '80s, you know, um, they didn't have the, all the resources and things that they <laughs> yeah. had now. So I, I went out and and got my my master's in business in the in the business school at Notre Dame, and was able to coach. So kind of like the grad assistant, mm -hmm. which doesn't really exist anymore. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
So I was a grad assistant there. And, you know, again, it was a great, you know, I had a great educational experience and, and kind of cut my teeth on coaching. But it was more like, all right, I can go to school yeah. because mm-hmm. I, I can afford to do it because I'm coaching. So it was more sure. of like a means to an end. Sure. And then – whatever it was, you know, um, 16, 17 years later, Kevin Anderson, who had been the head assistant at, at Notre Dame, was, was stepping away, and they needed somebody. And I, I talked my wife into coming back. My wife's a Notre Dame grad as well. And so, so you know, again, I think it starts with, you know, Kevin, you know, just – and I think I, one of the lessons I learned from him is that, you know, there, there are people who know things, and then, if, then there's knowing people. And so, you know, he did – like, I, I – was you know I was playing I was trying to play at a really high level at that point. My brother Steve was a great player, was my inspiration, and so you know he 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 basically said, well I know this guy's brother, and if he's connected to him and clearly not adopted, um, <laughs> you know I, I know I'm getting a good person who's going to work hard, That's, and yeah. and and so, I did that, and and you learn a lot of lessons about how to hire people based a little bit less on their resume, because I hadn't coached really. Since then, I coached a little high school and I coached a Division two school, but I, yep. not at that level. So, right. but I think he made a bet on people and um, character and and work ethic, and you know, and so yeah, it was an unbelievable experience. It's a great place. I have unbelievable sure. strong feelings there. You know, my two of my children went to and were athletes at Notre Dame, mm-hmm. and um, they got unbelievable education as a byproduct of my um, employment at. Notre Dame and, you know, and again, great, just a, you know, I think, uh, you know, certain schools like Harvard and Notre Dame attract certain kinds of people and Certainly. there's a self-selection that happens. And if you're clear on the values that you are about, not that you don't have to work hard in recruiting, but there's a natural kind of Absolutely. law of attraction yeah. To, yeah. to those kinds of places. And yeah. I'm fortunate to be at one now, uh, Harvard, and, you know, it was definitely at one with, with Notre Dame. So, you know, being there and being able to coach with Kevin and Matt Carwick and John Crawley mm-hmm. and Kevin Anderson and Brian Fisher and Hutch and just, just great run of, of people. And, and, and I was so, so happy for their success. You know, yeah. I, I thought I'd be a little bit more, you know, envious. Sure. You know, sure. To, be, uh, to be honest. Sure. Um, my, my wife, Tracy, who, who's a Notre Dame grad, is a doctor here in Boston. She kind of helped me see that that was not how you should feel. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. and she helped kind of guide me to see. And we went down for the Final Four, and I found myself unbelievably happy for That's the, awesome. the guys that I helped recruit. That's there. awesome. Yeah, and and I like if you would have said. A year ago when I had those feelings, <laughs> listen, I left on my own accord, yeah. you know, for a great opportunity here. But, like, you know, I have a, uh, you know, great wife, and she helped me. And I, I had unbelievable joy for those guys because I'd known some of those kids since they were 15 or 16 years old. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And, I mean, I think, you know, you touched on just – like the work ethic and the compete level. I mean, you know, the Kavanaugh's, I think, embody that as a program wide for Notre Dame, right? And, you know, so obviously great to see and, you know, love to hear that, uh, you know, obviously you had great relationships with all those guys. So um, I guess, you know, just moving on, you know, just real quick, you know, I think you already kind of touched on it, what drew you to Harvard, right? It's just obviously such a prestigious school. Um, I I did want to touch on how your Harvard tenure kind of kicked off. Obviously, that was uh, a bit of a, a night, nightmare scenario with COVID, and that was the first year. And then, obviously, the following year, the Ivy League kind of canceled the season. So just kind of walk me through that and kind of how you just were able to kind of navigate that whole thing. And, you know, obviously, the, the first couple months of your tenure were certainly uh, certainly pretty pretty crazy. Yeah. Listen, nobody, had, you, know, you know, Harvard was at the forefront of everything that – was connected to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. The you know Harvard Harvard has you know thirteen or fourteen hospitals here in Boston. They were deeply involved in all the vaccines. Yeah, they have a school of public health. No one was asking me what my opinion was, so I don't. I didn't like. I didn't. You know, I did. You know, part of feeling powerless at times is accepting the fact that you're powerless, and sure. versus 
believing that you have some impact on something <laughs> yeah. and then kind of wallowing in when it doesn't become your outcome. So I, you know, sure. I accepted the fact that I wasn't going to decide whether we were going to play or yeah. not or what, what the next year was going to be like. So, so I tried to turn, you know, lemons into lemonade. We, there you, go. you know, and again, I, I, it's been a long time, so I can't speak to all the details, but we accepted our, our fate. And then we went on about the work, to either get better as coaches and get better as a team, get better as a culture. And I think, nice. yep. you know, the, the, the work that we did ended up in us making the NCAA tournament with, you know, 14, 15 freshmen playing. Yeah. You know, and so, yeah. So, you know, who, who knows if you have that year in 22, if you don't have the disappointment of the other thing. And so, sure. that, and as I told my team, it's like, if you think life is fair, <laughs> yeah. you let go of that. Yeah, real quick. <laughs> Belief really quickly. You don't always get what you want. Yep. Sometimes you get sure. what you need. Sure. Sometimes you get what you deserve. Sometimes you don't. And, like, crying in your pillow about it is not going to sure. be in. That's why athletes, if you look 10 years from now, at, place, at schools like Notre Dame and Harvard and, you know, the, the places that, that produce elite leaders. Sure. Like, the pandemic is going to is going to produce some of the best managers in a variety of industries because they're used to failing mm -hmm. and they're used to disappointment. You don't win every game, mm -hmm. and so those that resiliency sure is why athletes are so successful. Yeah, and the 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 the, the outcome of the pandemic is going to further prove that. When you start looking at CEOs and managers and managing directors and partners in law firms and leaders in government, and leaders in business, it's going to be a lot of Harvard grads, for example, in that group. There usually is, <laughs> but I think more than usual. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think you that touched on a great point, right? You can only control what you can control. You know, you have to lead. You know, and just kind of again, <laughs> the whole powerless thing to it. Certainly, yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty much it. <laughs> but uh, all right, so, yeah, I, I do want to kind of move on into just, I guess, you know. You're kind of, you know, what is like the theme of Harvard? Uh, we talked with maybe like Coach Wolf from NGIT and he touched on things like, you know, they want to make sure, you know, they have like things that they want their program to strive to be and live by, but they want to make sure they're not just words on the wall. Um, so I guess just maybe some things that you guys, you know, pride yourselves on. Uh, you know, obviously I've heard the word compete come out of your mouth a whole lot, work ethic, things like that. Um, but I guess just maybe some themes that you truly try to pride your program on and, you know, things you, tr you guys try to embody. Yeah, I think it's a lot of the same. Yeah. Things. I, I'm not a huge shirt shooting shirt quote person. For I'm sure. not a, you know, we don't hang back. Like we, we have a quote on our, uh, um, hallway. It's, it's a little literary and it's a little Harvardy, Harvardy. So I'm not going to share it with you because I'll probably catch some ricochets if I do. But, um, you know, I, th I think the most important, <clears throat> I think the, 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 the trait that we try to communicate is gratitude okay. and yeah. because there's very few guys on our team who got into Harvard on their own. Sure. And sure. You know, so the kind the, the, the guys who, who were here as student athletes, they had unbelievable credentials and they had great skill and they, we, you know, deem them as, as recruitable here. So nobody got here on their own. Sure. And if you accept that, you tend to be very appreciative of, being here and, yeah. and, and getting the, the benefits of, of an elite education that is the envy of the planet, even, even with all the bad PR that, that we've gotten. It's still, you know, when you're holding your son or daughter, that's where, that's what you're thinking about. Yeah. That's where you would like your ch child to go. And so, so if we can kind of hold on to that sense of gratitude about Absolutely. being here, it makes you think about the people that helped you get here. Yeah. And when you start thinking about others and you start thinking about the people who kind of nudged and inspired and, and nurtured you to get here, mm -hmm. it's not a lot to ask to yep. work really hard yep. at being a really good player, yep. being a really good person and teammate, you know, caring about the, the investment your parents are making and tuition to have you come here. If you can roll all those things together, then showing up for practice in a weight room or shooting extra or watching extra film, yeah, that seems like an acknowledgement sure. of all the people that helped you get here. That's the least you can do. Sure. Yeah. So 
that's that that's our message, and we don't have to beat our guys over the head with them. They see examples of that kind of spirit and generosity all around them, and I don't have to make that speech that's, very often because our guys get it. That's awesome. I, I love that answer. That's definitely an answer. I, I you know I don't think you hear a lot too often either, which is you know I, you know, I mean. You're you're in a fortunate spot, and you know you might as well just yeah keep working hard. So uh, I love that answer, Coach. I guess I just want to kind of finish up with one kind of question. I, I'm a, I was always curious, you know, when I was playing, right? Like we to like track our kind of work or, or something like that, right? We wore heart rate monitors and things like that. We tracked like you know how much we were putting in and things like that. I just wanted to kind of pick your brain. Are like analytics starting to become bigger into lacrosse or you know things like that, like sports science type things? Um, you know, we'd love to kind of pick your brain on that. And as if that's, you know, something that you've seen in the uh, college game kind of start to take off a little bit. Yeah, no, listen, one, the short answer to that is, is yes. Mm-hmm. The, um, we probably have, I, I'm, I, I, cause we, we were just making a graphic about kind of our partners and suppliers and sure. it was about 15 people and about eight or nine of them are kind of performance and recovery based gotcha. uh, yeah. technology. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of the great benefits of being at a place like Harvard is having, you know, alumni and resources where we can invest in that. So, an example, our whole team wears Catapult. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's what we wore. (laughs) I I don't know if there's a lot of teams that have their own and their whole team is outfitted. Mm -hmm. So, we, we track all of our guys' movements every time that we're on the field. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a relationship with Whoop. I don't know if you know what Whoop is. Yeah, certainly. It's a um, Harvard squash player founded. It's based yep. here in Boston. So yep. our, our whole team yep. is on Whoop. So we're tracking, you know, sleep and, and recovery. And well, I'm not tracking individually because I don't want to, and nor am I allowed to because it's a privacy thing. Mm-hmm. But it's really about in, insights for your, your players. Yeah. Um, we have, I don't know, 15 Norma Techs. We have... Uh, game ready, which is a nice, uh, um, uh, instead of having a bag of ice on your ankle, you wear a device that kind of yeah, flows yeah. through. Um, so we have a bunch of those hyper ice and hyper volt and electronic roller stimulation yep. things and yep. assault bikes. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, so we, we have all of these, these tools to help prepare our guys, help to maintain, help them to recover. And, you know, the challenge is, is that. The, the, the math part of that, the analytical part, you really need to invest in some people to do that. So we sure. we kind of outsource that sure. to evaluate, you know, the amount of work someone does in a practice or in a game and, and how you make decisions about what your future practices are going to be like. We're not we're not making in game decisions on that. Right. Mostly we're using it to modify our practices and yep. our training. Mm-hmm. Um but I'm, I'm looking. We just, you know, had a budget meeting. I'm looking for more and more tools and devices, whether it's uh, virtual reality for goalies and things like that. Oh, wow. So we're just, so we're, you know, I'm always looking for that. You know, as we're as we're ramping up our talent and our depth, sure. You know, in our in our tenure here, yeah. we also want to have this technology um, that can help guide us. Yeah, absolutely. That's that would be sick. Virtual reality for goalies. That would be very very interesting. I would. <laughs> that's pretty sick. Yeah. But, um, all right, coach, that's, you know, that's kind of all I, I wanted to touch on. Thank you again for, uh, for sitting down with me. I will be sure to, uh, say hello to my dad and the Levittown boys for you. And, uh, good luck the rest of the way. Good luck this weekend. And yeah, we'll be pulling for you. Awesome. Thanks.